Um, hello, everyone. My name is Beatrice Habak. Um, I'm a master's candidate, and I also um, am a research assistant for the University of Texas Inequality Project, which is also called UTIP. Um, the paper I'm presenting today uh, summarizes an update and revision of the pay and income inequality measures calculated by the University of Texas Inequality Project, which was started in 1999. Uh, the data set, which is known as UTIP UNIDO, consists of measures of uh, cross sector industrial pay inequality uh, computed using the between group component of TILES T, st T statistic across a consistent set of industrial sectors. In total, it has 3,871 observations over 149 countries, covering the years 1963 to 2008. Um, my work with the project has been specifically with the estimated um, household income inequality, or EHI, data set which was also extended as part of this update. The data set consists of estimates of the Gini coefficient using gross household income. These are derived using a regression of the original high quality Gini coefficients from the Dininger and Squire data set published in 1996 against the UTIP UNIDO measures. And there are also controls for the share of manufacturing and total employment and dummy variables for uh, whether income or expenditure were used, whether the unit of analysis is the household or the person, and whether the income concept is gross or net of taxes and transfers. Um, Ellen Final here, can I point with this? Um, that is um, the log of the tile measure, and as you can see, it's, a, um, it's clear that the tile index is a strong indicator of the Gini measure. Um, so the coverage, as I mentioned, is the same as for the UTIP UNIDO measures. And uh, first, I'd like to show you some maps that highlight the coverage of the EHI estimates by decade. So here we have the 1960s. The red hues represent values of the Gini coefficient below 35, with countries with the lowest inequality in pink. And then the blue hues represent values above 35, with the highest inequality in dark blue. So here you can see Canada and the U.S. with values in the low 30s, um, on par with some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and with Australia. And then here in the 1970s, um, you see increases in inequality in the US and India. And we have uh, more data coverage with China appearing on the map. Here in the 80s, we see increasing inequality in Canada and more coverage in South America and Africa. In the 90s, we start to see rising inequality in South America and Africa. Uh, India, Pakistan, uh, much of Eastern Europe, and Australia. And finally, in the 2000s, uh, most countries are still seeing a rise, rising trend in inequality. So these maps give you an idea of the coverage of the EHI measures and how accurately they compare to worldwide trends. Um, and my specific project um, focused on seeing how the EHI measures compared um, to other measures based on national household surveys. So for a set of about um, 40 or so countries, I looked at any reputable Gini coefficients I could find from international organizations, um, national statistical institutes, and individual researchers, and many people here <laughs> will know because I emailed you a lot. <laughs> so this is the fruit of that work. Um, so I coded the measures based on what type of income concept was used and the unit of analysis, and then I made charts for each country. So black represents our measure, green is for market income, blue is for gross income, red is for net income, and yellow is for consumption. And then there were some cases where I just wasn't able to find the information about the income concepts, so those are in purple. Um, in addition, dotted lines represent measures of personal income and solid lines represent household income. And then the very light dotted lines represent the SWID estimates by Frederick Soltz. So our main finding is that our measures are quite consistent with the existing literature with a few exceptions, which I'll, n I'll mention later on. Um, so this is Canada. One of the first things you notice is the sheer breadth of the measures. So for example, in the year 1998, right here, um, you can see um, market income inequality is measured at right about 52 points. And then 
uh, disposable income inequality is measured at about uh, 29 points. And that's for just the same year, um, so it's pretty, pretty broad. Uh, there's a similar trend for all of the advanced social democracies in the series. And um, there are quite a few studies out there that um, say that the most advanced countries have very unequal primary distributions and that these are offset by redistribution policies. However, if you look at the original UTIP UNIDO data, um, which looks specifically at pay inequality, it seems that the Nordic and North European countries are uh, actually the most egalitarian in their primary structures. So how do we explain the paradox? Um, well, our answer is that in advanced welfare states, uh, very high market income inequality must be due to the presence of households with zero market income. And presumably in countries with strong public pension systems, it's possible for many elderly couples and uh, single individuals of all ages, age, ages I'm sorry, to form households on non-market income, while these households would be very rare in countries where uh, market income is necessary for survival. Uh, one of the other things you notice here is that the measures, or our measure fall, falls generally um, above net income, uh, below those for market income, and around those for gross income, which is a pretty um, common pattern. So here is Denmark. And you can kind of see the similar pattern. Um, here's France. This is one of the countries where the data wasn't very continuous, so there are a lot of uh, markers uh, rather than lines. Here's Germany. I included uh, measures for East, uh, West, and Unified Germany. And here you can see we're right on par with the gross household income measures. Here's Greece. And Italy, you can see most of the measures are based on net income here. Here's Japan. Um, here you can see that uh, the measures at the bottom seem to be very different from the other ones. You've got net and market income and gross all below uh, most of the other measures. And um, that's due to the survey choice of the authors and they told me specifically that because of the sample restrictions, um, they wouldn't be comparable. But I wanted to include them just to show how much survey choice really does matter when we're making inferences about the measures. Um, here we have the Netherlands. As I mentioned before, the very high market income inequality is what would be expected. Uh, here's Spain. Sweden. Again, the high market income inequality. Here's the UK, which is a very well-documented country. Um, and then here's the US. And this is actually a case where our measures are problematic because um, it doesn't, um, it misses the capital income that a lot of the other sources pick up. So this next set of countries, um, I should mention that my colleague Alexandra Malinowska collected the data for these um, Eastern European countries. And uh, this set of countries has a narrow but still distinct difference between market income inequality and disposable income inequality. Um, one explanation for this could be that these countries don't have welfare states as developed as those in Northern Europe, but neither do they have the um, very high level of pay inequality you see in Latin America and Africa a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. So um, this seems to support the interpretation uh, about the high levels of market income inequality I mentioned before. Um, that being said, though, a lot of the market income measures um, are very erratic and variable, and they can't really be said to be trustful indicators of um, changing economic conditions. So here's Hungary. Poland, Russia, and 
and Ukraine. And once we start moving away from the long industrialized countries, we encounter other issues with the data. So sometimes there are less, dependent, uh, less independent sources of data, like the case of Mexico, where all of my sources of data come from the same household survey conducted by the National Institute of Statistics and Geography. So the variances present in this data are all a result of uh, variable definition, sampling, and data construction differences. Um, at other times you'll see a lot more purple because I wasn't able to find income definitions. Um, and we also see that for these countries uh, there's much less distinction between market, gross, and disposable income measures. Um, on average they tend to overlook and uh, overlap and look jumbled. So this supports the general idea that market and disposable income are partially determined by the structure of the welfare state. And for India, most of the other data out there tends to be consumption-based, but the one uh, measure published by the LIS right here is only about two genie points off from where we are, so that's a good sign. Uh, we also have a few cases where the EHI estimate tends to be problematic, and in these cases our estimate is generally too low. So these include Brazil, South Africa, Colombia, and Thailand. So here's Brazil. Uh, we don't really know why our estimate is off here, but we have a few guesses. So one is that um, Brazil and South Africa are countries with particularly well-known divides. In Brazil, it's north-south. In South Africa, it's black and white. Another reason could be just um, idiosyncratic measurement uh, in these countries. And here's South Africa. And Thailand. So here I just have some uh, summary statistics on the EHI. more. Um, this chart shows the global mean values um, and as you can see it picks up the, the widespread rise in inequality in the 80s and in the 90s which is pretty common across other measures too. So to offer some conclusions uh, from the charts, we can see that the literature on income inequality generally is very messy. In advanced countries, the difference between market gross and disposable income is usually very large. Um, our number is usually quite close to the other gross income estimates and generally between the market and disposable income estimates, which means that the underlying um, industrial pay inequality measures on which the EHI are based are a pretty good instrument for income inequality generally, with some exceptions such as the problem of the capital income in the US and the level estimates for a few uh, large middle income countries like Brazil and South Africa. So if you found this interesting, uh, if you're interested in us using the data, please visit our website. And we also welcome your comments and feedback. So, thank you.